The views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the station, its management, nor its advertisers. A very good evening and welcome to Venture In with myself, Jan Dilinuku from 6 to 7 p.m. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today we have a conversation with the CEO of the Dow Academy, talking all things education and what they're doing in the innovation space. Um, good evening, listeners. My name is Cheshe Dow. And I am the Chief Executive Officer at the Dow Academy in Mutrit. Okay. Um, and let's talk a little bit about um, the Dow Academy. How did that name come about? Okay. Um, it's my belief and those of my colleagues that uh, you work harder when your name is on the door. And if you're willing to lend your name to something, I think it speaks to the importance that you place on the work being done. For us, um, education is something that's very close to our hearts. Um, my father was a teacher. My mother founded a school. So it's something that's always been a big part of my life. And the Dow name has a very rich legacy. And for us, um, coming from Mutrudi, having grown up in this neighborhood, we wanted to be clear that we are coming home after a long trip around the world in many ways to really give back in a meaningful way to what this community is capable of and what these kids can become. Mm. I mean, you've got a quite a rich background in corporate, um, and I'm also hearing a, a theme or a thread of um, starting or continuing the family business, thinking multi generationally. Um, any challenges in your career, or you think um, great highlights in your career to this point? Um, yes, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's always challenges, no matter what we're doing in this world, and I think. Um, I mean, I grew up in Mutri, like I said, like I grew up my whole life in, in actually this area. My family home is a short walk away from here. So it was a long trip back here. And I think um, the major challenge that I think I had to struggle with was really sort of um, coalescing and really properly defining myself and my place in the world. Because even though I grew up here, I went to school abroad. And there was a lot of things, I think, to reconcile once you go out into the world as, you know, a village girl from Mutri, so far away from home. And the, my professions that I've chosen over the year, the jobs I've chosen over the years, have, have been very corporatized. And I think it was, in many ways, um, there was some fear in it, I think, because um, the education system that I grew up in really promoted certain types of professions. So I didn't fully explore other areas, other things that I could have gotten into. And um, throughout my adult life, I always really looked back on education. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be just amazing? if there was a school that allowed kids to be who they are. I mean, basic education is 13 years of a child's life. And if they can't have that time to fully find out what their interests are, what their talents are, and to have those nurtured and supported in a meaningful way, then what are we doing in basic education? So it has always been really my dream to do that in a big and meaningful way and in Botswana, nowhere else but in Botswana. And that's why I find myself here. Hmm. Um, I love it. So you school abroad. One of the challenges you are is, is you know, ident- having your place in the world. Um, I've been thinking a lot about identity um, to mm-hmm. say, but what is identity? Um, what, what, what would you say is, is, is defines a Motswana in terms of our identity on the global stage? Um, honestly, I think the things that define Botswana and Botswana are the stories that we have not had the courage to tell. Um, I have always held the view that we come from great people. I think the story of Botswana, even just since independence, when you think about it, is genuinely an amazing story for a leadership that in many ways had no sense of what it is to be a country, to be a democracy, to be um, a sovereign nation. And to dare to think that they could unite a country of this size with a population that small spread across I mean, we think about where Zabon is and where Shakaway is. That is a huge distance without technology, without proper transport. And for me, that audacity, that courage is something that I've always held on to. So while um, the books and the textbooks that I've read over the years did not really um, recognize that or speak of it in any sort of great way, it's something that I could never, ever let go of, no matter how we were being cast in, in public spaces. So now I think genuinely, I think what defines Botswana is... Um, not the unlikeliness of it, but the, 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 I guess it is audacity in a way. I mean, to dare to think that we can actually be a sovereign nation, to dare mm-hmm. to think we could create, I mean, we could meaningfully manage diamonds and create a country, to think, to actually jointly decide that it's okay, everyone must have access to education and healthcare. I think that community value for me is a big thing. And it's something that, that I really think we, as a people, 
we need to get back to in very real terms because what is possible here what has happened here was only possible because people were acting in concert hmm love it um giving back in very real terms I, you know last week I was having a chat with another entrepreneur and he at some point schooled in Australia mm. um and did some research on you know having affordable household uh, ha- household in Botswana and he came back became a lecturer and then you know now he's only starting to now innovate and actually provide solutions in the market from an entrepreneur's perspective and I was saying to him you know that's a great story because a lot of people who go into the diaspora or about one in the diaspora um they come back some of them get lost they don't know what to do you know it's almost mm-hmm. as if that exposure that they got um overseas is is is, is the experience some sort of a brain drain um but let's talk about you um your exposure to the global education system you come back you know you're working and then now here you are with the Dow Academy of course it was a family business but let's talk a little bit about you know what the Dow Academy now does and mm-hmm. how you're taking some of that exposure that you've gotten on the global stage into the academy okay so um the Dow Academy is um a private preschool primary school and secondary school and we did take over an existing school so it was I mean, we were building on 27 years of solid legacy. The school was doing what schools have traditionally done well. The kids learned to read, write, count, and the exam results have been very good, um, PSLE and at IGCSE level. So that was solid. But what, for me, I always thought was missing was really sort of um, an education that was around the child. For my part, I always give this example that um, one of my favorite subjects in school was mathematics. but uh, and I really enjoyed it but I I always learned it as an abstraction but only as I got older I really appreciate how many things it actually touches but I also thought um there were many children for whom they could not understand or did not really connect with how the subjects were delivered and I just thought there needs to be a way to sort of really um a create a, a program a curriculum and a way of teaching that allows children to find their way to mathematics or to the arts or to the sciences in a way that makes sense for them and my education abroad i went to um kenyan college in ohio and it's a liberal arts institution and what i have always and even now i i, I have a small child now and i just think myself she needs to go to a school just like that university like that because what was amazing about it is that you were required to get your degree it doesn't matter what you do at the end but in your time your four years there you were required to take um a whole host of of disciplines but as psychology math the language it doesn't matter that your your degree was in physics but you were required to take something from the arts from the humanities from history from geography mm-hmm. and that really sort of opens up i think but the lens through which you see the world and it gives you all kinds of toolkits about how to solve and to engage with the world and i really thought it's a great model in university but it would be even more powerful if that was how we began kids from early childhood and that's why we are doing the work we're doing at the Dow Academy. I mean right now we are having children learn to code, we're having them pull apart laptops and put them back together, design graphic novels, design video games, and it's not even so much about the video game or the coding or the laptop. It's about them understanding that they can have an impact in the world, that they can solve problems that exist in the world. And we want to show them this from a very early age because There's too many things in Botswana that remain a black box and they don't have to be because for so long as they're black box we will never improve upon them we will never add to them and we'll never contribute. So we want children whom after 13 years of basic education can contribute because at 13 after that you are 18 years old. They are king to 18 year old. In this in the history of this country you could actually lead a whole nation. The Bakhata or the Bangwatu or the Batawan or the Bakalaka you could be entrusted with that leadership position because the community that raised you had confidence they had prepared you to participate and i think we need to get back to at a basic education level hmm um i think you've already answered this but let me just ask it in, in case there's a, a better way you, you, you want to explain it um mm. in in this case um in the next 5 to 10 years or even now h- how do you fi- how do you define success um as an academy um for us our success to be honest is already coming through because our I, our the way we measure success is through the feedback we get so the feedback is in our students right now our six students last term third term 2020 they did a short film they had the courage they had the imagination and creativity they had the space to create a short film that short film is now in short film festival in Italy 
that is huge. Those kids are discovering talent and capacity for impact they had no idea they could actually achieve. The success that I see coming through is we are creating learning experiences and spaces for students that are being supported by people whom we did not know 12 months ago, 13 months ago. But these people are reaching out to say, look, we heard what you're doing and I'm willing to spend my time teaching the kids about newspaper and journalism. Or I'm willing to spend my time teaching kids coding or whatever it is. But basically they were to say, we believe basic education can be improved and we're prepared to be part of that journey. So for me, that is how I measure success. And that, that's um, call to action that is coming through, even though we're not walking the streets and saying, come like this. So for me, that really is something that I, I value. I know you're um, at, at X co level, um, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, I was just talking to somebody um, if, a week ago, and he was saying to me, "It's so difficult to measure progress because it has to be quantitative and qualitative, and sometimes even progress in this simple conversation uh, could be you illustrating that you know, Mobotswana, we actually have a history of our communities developing us to be able to take leadership in our youth stages, um, mm -hmm. having observed." Um, your, your students or your student body with all this exposure, what do you think, what's different in them now ever since you started connecting them to industry? I think I've seen you also mm. exposing them to radio personalities. Um, have you seen any difference in, in, in themselves? It could be their confidence or the way they contribute in the classroom. Um, actually, it, it, it's it's um, surprisingly now kind of easy to see the difference because um, you remember COVID shut down schools end of March. Then we were on lockdown for two months. Then we all came back end of May, beginning of June. And the kids came back in a very subdued state because really there was all this uncertainty and things whirling around. And there was this sense of powerlessness. School was no longer the same. They couldn't play. They couldn't hug their friends. They couldn't hug their teachers. And only in third term is when we began our coding program, our media club and these different activities. And I tell you, you should see the kids skipping along, of course, in a line, one meter apart. But when they come to, to participate in media or come to code or come to do journalism or stuff like that, they feel powerful, which I think is something that we have for too long taken away from kids. And I see that as progress. I mean, the fact that um, one of our kids in the media club who last, it was as quiet as quiet could be. Um, we had a gentleman actually from the uh, Ministry of Trade, the private secretary to the assistant minister. He came and we talked to him about film and about the first Motswana to actually own a film camera. And this child is 11 years old. And her question was, how, how old was um, this gentleman when he made his first movie? Hmm. And that was a kind of courageous sort of, uh, you could see this child seeing themselves making a movie. Hmm. And that is the kind of question that says to us that these kids want to play. I mean, we have kids who are on holiday midterm break in Form 4 who went to journalism field trip on Monday and this child had the courage to say to um, our CIO, I want to spend some time with the television students this week. He's here this week. He could be on holiday, hanging out, watching TV, but that's the choice that he makes. And for me, that is progress because these kind of changes take a long time. So you do have to listen carefully because it is going to be um, small, but as long as every day we're getting reinforcement, for me, I see the change being coming through and even small things like not small things but even bigger things like for instance our rebuild the laptop program our first 10 machines came from my insurance relationship manager who i just happened to be telling look we need old machines because we need kids to work on them this gentleman i kid you not worked on his team for four five months because it was right before we went into lockdown by september when we were starting our program we had 10 machines from Bhutan life Hmm. Because he believed enough to say, I'm going to try and get you these machines. And that to me is feedback because people, I think, are yearning to have power, to have influence and to actually change the game in this space. Because it affects all of us when our education system fails our children. Venture in. Venture in. Every Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m. with Yandile Nugu. Half Hour is brought to you by Becky, your credit insurance and guarantee company of Botswana. Becky. Eliminating risk, propelling growth. The views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the station, its management, nor its advertisers.
If you've just joined us in conversation, we're having a chat with Ms. Dao, who is the CEO of the Dao Academy, having a chat around some of the things that they're doing uh, to position themselves as a world-class learning environment in the 21st century, and a little bit about some of the changes that they're going through as a result of COVID, how they've adapted, and where some of the opportunities have been. Speaking of the education system, um, mm-hmm. you've seen, you know, and, and I know the Dao Academy is a private um, school, mm-hmm. um, but we've seen public schools, you know, the top 10, within the top 10 schools, even the, 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 the school that's in position one um, mm-hmm. hasn't even skipped the 50% rate in terms of the number of students that have gotten, I think, a C going up. Yeah, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's it's a multidisciplinary challenge, and I suppose as somebody in the market, you know, you look at your your industry holistically. Um, when you see results like that, um, what's your line of thinking in terms of solutions to our education system? We've been investing a lot over the past years. It's been our priority area, top three priority areas, but it seems like. Um, the results are still deteriorating. Uh, from an industry's perspective, you know, what are your thoughts, solutions-wise? Um, okay, in terms of solution-wise, I do like what um, the policy direction the government is taking with regards to introducing a multiple pathway um, curriculum and, of course, outcome-based education. I think that is 100% the right direction. And for our part, we are also reviewing our curriculum this year too. You know, to line up so that our kids actually have these different avenues to pursue. But in terms of solutions, I am of the view, and I've always been of the view that in Botswana, I mean, given the amount of money that this country has spent on education, I mean, never mind basic, but even just university or graduate level education, the talent, the people, the hands, they are there. They are there. The only issue that I think I see is how we collaborate or the ways in which collaboration is facilitated. So, for what we said, um, our plan which we've you know shared with our our, count, our counterparts and colleagues is we want to be able to uh, we're a private school so we are able to make decisions faster and implement things faster because we're a small organization but what we see is creating a way where slices of what is that we do in a modular fashion can actually be taken and then the school down the road can actually come use it one of the things that we're going to be doing in the beginning second term, we're partnering with the University of Cincinnati to actually develop a continuing professional development program for our teachers. So what we would like to do is then invite teachers from our neighborhood schools to come and say, I mean, it's free of charge. We're getting the benefit because we have this relationship. Some of the teachers can come and join us. So I don't think the solutions are not. The solutions are in, they're in, they're in the streets, they're in the villages, they're in the country. But the question is, how do we harness them to make it happen? I mean, there are other larger infrastructure issues that need to be solved. But in terms of whether or not we have the capacity, the mind, the hands, they're there. I mean, even things like, um, for instance, the, the young man who's teaching um, our kids graphic novel design. I mean, he's, he's got a book. He's been working on this for a long time. He saw there's an opportunity. He called to say, look, look, I have this skill and I can actually um, share it with you guys. And because we are able, willing, and flexible, and fast enough to say, okay, this is a great thing, program we can design for our kids and get it done, we're able to get it into the program. And it may be for three months, maybe for a year, maybe for six months. But the reality is, if we could find a way to harness what is inside this country, I think we could actually make some real shifts in terms of how our education uh, our performance actually is. But mm-hmm. the other big thing, I think, is around, I mean, parent involvement is a big issue that needs to be, um, we need to find a way to sort of either support parents or bring them closer to how education is delivered and what actually happens inside of classrooms. And the last one that I will say is around learner screening and just really understanding how children learn and what their challenges are from an early age. Because some children genuinely do have some sort of um, either reading challenges, learning challenges, developmental challenges. And the question must always be asked, are we catching those early enough? And even when we do, do we have the infrastructure to support them to actually still go on a learning journey that makes sense for us and that's i think there are many things that can be done but i think we have the people that i have no doubt but we just need to create a way for them all to pull together to actually deliver the change Hmm. um i love your thought around um the solutions being the community i've also done some work in education and i know that even the students themselves no matter how young they actually have the solutions um which 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 brings me to this point again going back to the idea of um, you as an academy connecting uh, students to industry at such a, mm. a young age. Um, one of the, um, uh, I think, uh, points or discoveries that I've made is that 
Um, unemployment is also caused by industry not innovating at a quicker rate um, to match the rate at which the education system is churning out graduates, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to find out from you, as these young people, I mean, people always say we have a demographic dividend in Africa, we need to make the most of it, and you kind of wonder, what does that actually mean? You know, when people say young people are innovative and creative. So have you actually seen um, your, your, your students adding value to industry? We often assume that industry would come and teach them and they will learn, but never really think about industry also actually learning from the young people. Um, what, what I'll say to you is this. Um, one of our, uh, our colleagues here, he's, he's American, right? And um, then we've got Zimbabweans, and we've got some different nationalities in the space. And what the observations that I think really come out for me is that children in early childhood, whether it's primary or secondary, we don't teach them, at least we haven't done a good job, I think, historically, of teaching them to dare to put their hand up to say, I have a solution. Or mm. I think maybe we do X or do Y. Mm. I mean, even this, yesterday I had a chat with um, the tele radio interns. These are our X Form 5 students who are building a studio to start producing content. And these kids, they're some of our best and brightest, 48 point students, okay? So I was saying, okay, fine, let's talk about what's next. You're going to university, right? Why are you going to university? What do you want out of the experience? You know, all this sort of stuff. How do you even prepare for us to have this conversation? You knew I was coming today. Are you looking to impress me in any way? Or are you just looking to sit here and be the recipient of what I'm going to say, right? Mm. And at the end of it, I, I mean, to find out really what they have to offer, you really have to pick and prod and spend long amounts of time, which is something we need to get past. I mean, this not, I won't say false modesty, but this um, reticence of young Botswana children, whether it's in interviews or whether it's later on in, in university, to actually just put up my hand and say, you know what, I can sing. Or I can, so I can design, I can do whatever. We need for kids to be making those kind of declarative statements. But for you to find out what they're actually capable of, you have to push them. So because now they're in a safe space, now I was saying, I was like, look, we're in a safe space. So I have time to actually find out more about you, to support you, to say, okay, Let's unpack this. What do you want to do? What do you really have to offer? How do you design your CV? But the real world doesn't have that level of patience or time because you are competing with the whole world. So, and that's why for us, a big part of our offering also now is life skills. We've started a, a mental health coaching session beginning next week. We've, started, we've got somebody, I mean, our branch manager, if you believe it, our SMB branch manager, um, Airport Junction, so shout out to SMB, um, came to see the screening of our short film last uh, in January. And then Monday, she came to say, you know what? I want to contribute and teach kids leadership skills. She's a mm. certified Maxwell coach. And she's spending every Wednesday, she's coming to talk to our tell you kids about how to influence, how to be in the world, how to lead, how to dare to be brave and bold about what you can do. And these are things that, I, and, and these kids after this process will be better able to represent themselves. And I think, like I've said, the, what is amazing about Botswana are the stories that we do not tell. I mean, and there's so many amazing stories. And until we own that legacy and it is an amazing I mean it really is an amazing legacy and I'm always struck because people who are not from Botswana they come to Botswana they're just always amazed they're like oh my gosh how how and, and we never really have an answer for that <laughs> I, don't know if, I, don't, I don't know why we don't have an answer for it. <laughs> yeah but the thing is we did it yeah so when will we own that we did it who yeah. owns that we did it if not us so I for me I think that is we did a culture and energy and just change I want to see in the kids. By the time they get to 18 years old, they must be clear about their story. They must be clear about where they come from and how this has shaped who they are and what this means about their place in the world. And that is what we're working to sort of really achieve. Mm. Um, uh, is, 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 I'm picking um, your slogan, Rdi um, yeah. Is Jen, Jen, to add anything to it as to why that's the slogan? But I think you've already answered yeah, and, and really, I, I think it's time for us to take back the narrative and our story. I mean, the diamonds are, are beautiful. I mean, I worked in diamonds. They're beautiful stones, and they are appreciated and coveted all over the world. But the fact that the world can covet Botswana's diamonds is because they are beneath our feet. Other countries have materially, significantly failed to create that value chain, that opportunity, that revenue stream that can build a country. So I, we actually took a decision to say, you know what, we're taking that back because that is our story. And diamonds, like, diamonds take a long time to become diamonds. They take hundreds of years beneath the earth and they take patience to be found and they take patience for the beauty to be brought out. And like diamonds, people are valuable because we decide they're valuable. 
So, and and even more like diamonds, it takes a diamond to scratch to hurt another diamond. And human beings are the same. It takes one another person to hurt another person. But the reverse of that is true. It takes a community to raise a child. And that is why for us, we are diamonds. And we mean to bring a kind of attention to this that the world has never seen. Hmm. Let's, let's now talk about business, the technical aspects to it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the business model of, in, of, of a school is, is in such a way that, um, you know, you would be directly affected by, I know we're in a state of an emergency, um, mm-hmm. and people have gone through retrenchments, some of them have gone through salary cuts, and that would directly affect individuals like yourself or institutions like yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, from a business perspective, um, what's been the impact of COVID on on the Dow Academy? Um, when right before the the pandemic properly hit, actually, I read a quote by somebody who said, um, "You must stay committed to the vision and not the model." So the truth is, when we began last year, we had a lot of different plans around what we're going to do in 2020. But then COVID hit, and then we had to adjust. Our mission is growing problem solvers. So um, we went from having this outlook, these projections, what's going to happen, we're going to have this event, do this, then we're going to have interns from all over the world and all that sort of stuff to being, we can't travel, we, we, we don't even know if we're going to be open come second term. So that, I think, really shook all of us. I mean, not just the school, but shook the whole world. But what I, I think I found liberating as a, as a business manager or owner was that it was actually, it opened up my thinking because I used to travel a lot before um, in my old job when I was in South I traveled a significant amount. So I spent a lot of time in Heathrow Airport in, in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg. And the images of all the airplanes in Heathrow grounded. For some reason, that really shook me because it really caused me to question very many assumptions around what it is, to, it, what, what a school is, what holds it together, and what does it take for it to survive all kinds of challenges. We came in, we started again. We didn't know, like many people were operating with a lot of uncertainty, but we committed to the, the mission. We are going problem solvers. We're going to reimagine education. We want kids to have a different experience. Okay, fine. The conditions have changed, but how do we actually adjust? And we made the adjustment. It was not easy. It was not easy. We were scared. Our teachers were scared. Our parents were scared. Our children were scared. But we believed in where we were going because um, an assumption that I hold near and dear to my heart is that for so long as women are having babies, somebody must take care of them and somebody must educate them. What we teach them and how we teach them may change, but that activity must still go on. So we had to pivot, we had to make some things, and, and we did. And I mean, don't get me wrong, it, it, is, it has been very expensive managing COVID and it's caused us to learn all kinds of skills, introduce, introduce all kinds of protocols and processes that we didn't have before. But interestingly, um, I mean, a school is full of people whose primary job is to take care of children. So we got on with the business of doing it. I mean, we've taken financial losses like everybody else, but throughout the pandemic, we've continued to deliver value. I mean, it's borne out by the fact that our kids, PSLE for Hatland, they were number one. IGCSC, um, the average point score was 40.5. I mean, we had above C, it's 85%. And in really tough subjects too, like bio, science, the ones that everybody struggles with. So for me, even though the challenges were very real, um, we still came out of it. And I think what was important is we didn't focus on we want 100% pass or 80% pass. Or we focused on the people, on the kids, getting them in, making them feel comfortable, getting them out every day, one day at a time. On the teachers, can they come in today? How do we respond when there's a problem? Communicating. We communicate. And if you're on our WhatsApp group, you would be inundated. We talk to our parents all the time because it was a shared journey. There was a lot of uncertainty, but we were committed to make the journey. <sighs> Yes, and and, yeah. and and you know, um, one would imagine COVID, as much as there were challenges, you, you had to adapt, change your processes and um, invest money that you hadn't planned on investing, yeah. whilst you're still not sure about your revenue streams as well. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the opportunity. Um, yeah. Did this bring any opportunity um for you as a business where you feel like you know what actually if COVID never came we never would have done this or we would have done this in five years no definitely I mean one of the early things was around um, creating video lessons or video content we went from being in class to saying okay if we had to continue how could we possibly continue even if it's not a full-time basis how could we 
still present material to our kids. So people had to get on board and get on board fast to deliver that experience and still continue the kids learning. And the other big thing that um, COVID did for us is people who would have been otherwise engaged were suddenly available. So, um, for instance, the, the gentlemen, the two gentlemen who are partnering with us, the media club, these people ordinarily would have been in South Africa filming, doing all kinds of other projects. But COVID found them on the side of the border. They were here and they said, okay, maybe we can do something together. Mm-hmm. We have, um, two weeks ago, we had um, a violinist from Holland speaking to a video conference with the kids in media club and the radio kids about scoring, producing musical scores for movies and composition at the beginning of a conversation. They're willing to come here for two months, three months, to actually come and spend some time and teach kids about music. These people ordinarily, they would be in concert halls across Europe. But now it's COVID, they're here. And even our coding professors in the US, in the US or wherever they are, they're on online learning all the time. So their schedules are more flexible than they would have been if there was no COVID. Now they're now able to actually do that. The reason why we can have an online teaching summit for our students, I mean our teachers next term, is because they're not in full-time reporting to a school. So, I mean, I think somebody once said, um, you shouldn't waste a, a crisis. And there have been significant costs, personal, emotional losses that people have felt as a result of, of COVID. But the reality is that that was the same during World War One. that was the same through any major, you know, disruptive event in history. But human beings get on with the business of living. And that is what we're doing. Hmm. Um, okay, two last questions. Let's talk a little bit about um, what's coming next and if there are any exciting uh, projects that the Academy is working on that you want to share? Okay. Um, there's two big umbrella projects. One is we are working to convert our secondary school into a boarding school. And that energy, that impetus to move and to move faster than planned is because of COVID. Because one of the things that really brought into, into focus was the number of children in who actually go to South Africa for boarding school. Um, and they go for different reasons, but also a big part of it is that there's not that much private boarding tuition at secondary level on offer in Botswana. So for us, all those children being in a way kind of in limbo on what to do next really highlighted there was a real opportunity that they need to capitalize on. So we are going to be converting secondary school into boarding school. So we're very excited about that. And then um, because we will have the kids on boarding, it means we will have them for 24 hours a day for most of the year which also means that alongside the ordinary academic curriculum, we'll be able to really offer a proper technical and vocational education training for them for so long as they're with us. So that's a really exciting project that we're working on and um, watch, the, watch the space for that one. The other thing that I really want to um, talk about, just because it speaks to our value of community that we're seeking to drive and really seeking to emphasize that even though we are a school, I mean, mothers give birth to their babies, schools educate the babies, for 13 years and then university and then they go into the workplace. But what we really want to sort of emphasize is that we are preparing these children for the world, right? So um, we need you, the world, to come into the classroom to help us do that because what you want changes all the time. So that's why we are partnering with um, both local and international people, professionals, companies, organizations to bring what is needed for us to understand what is needed and then to help us deliver that for, for the kids. So our TDA Tech Series is something we're very proud of. And for anybody who's listening, whatever skill you have to offer, a month, three months, six months, one year, for so long as you are committed to reimagine education with us, to offer kids a learning experience different from what they currently have, we are the people to help you facilitate that. Thank you very much for coming on Venture In to share your story. Um, and if there's any last words you'd like to share, any thoughts or takeaways? Um, yeah, I think really it's just to say to, um, I guess, Botswana, the residents of Botswana and, and really the wider world that um, we all know basic education needs to change. And we've known for some time. And there are pockets all over the world. If you read up, you can see people across the world in different countries are doing different things to actually innovate in this space. And I think what I really want to share with people is that it's possible. Like, And, and when you get the momentum going, people actually gravitate to helping you create the solution. So I want to I guess, reassure people that the work is being done and we are open to collaborating and to supporting education delivery in, in our district, in our country, in any way that we can. And we are really underpinned, we're school underpinned by uh, focus and emphasis on value, courage, creativity, and community. What we teach our kids, how we teach our kids may change, but a value-based approach 
means that no matter what happens in the future that we cannot imagine at this point, our kids will have the courage to interact with it, to approach it. They'll be creative, to come up with solutions, and they will go through life understanding the value of community, creating communities that will help them see them through. And that is what really we stand for at the Dow Academy. Thank you very much and um, congratulations to you for all these milestones that you're achieving. And I wish you the very best for the year ahead. Thank you very much for your time and for the opportunity to have this conversation. I really appreciate it. The views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the station, its management, nor its advertisers. Half Hour was brought to you by Becky, your credit insurance and guarantee company of Botswana. Becky, eliminating risk, propelling growth. Making sense of the business world. Venture in every Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m. with Yandile Nuku.